Hey, hey, here I am on the clamp down with you again. Jamestown Community College, John O'Brien here. History 1520, spring semester 2020. Tonight we'll be looking at chapter 35, uh, our next topic, which means we've concluded chapter 34. You should have engaged or be engaging in discussion on chapter 34 and do the quiz for chapter 35, right? In an ideal situation, you would read, at least skim the chapter, uh, come to the lecture, reread the chapter, put it all together. Uh, actually, in this format, you can do it in any order you want, right? Uh, if you think the lectures help you to understand the reading, you do the lecture first, do the reading, come back, God forbid, watch the lecture again. But what else is there to do as we're uh, shuttered in, sequestered during this uh, COVID crisis? Um, do contact me if discussion boards are not working. Someone said it's not working last time, so... It works for me, but of course it always does. I have powers that students don't. So here's my discussion board. Uh, you can reply, leave something. It should be working. If not, email me. I'll get in there and try to fix it, okay? The quiz uh, for chapter 35, those seem to always work. <laughs> Probably unfortunately for you guys, right? The quizzes seem to always work. Um, they're just harder to find. So there it is, okay, quiz 35. And that's tonight's chapter, nationalism, right? So this post-World War I rise of nationalism in Africa, Asia, Latin America. Okay, our topic for today. Uh, before we get into it, keep up with current events as difficult as it might be to swallow. Uh, some tough stuff going on. But look, you're living in an historic era. Um, your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents lived through some tough times too. This is now your turn, something to tell your kids or your grandkids. And I guess I would encourage people perhaps to, to start writing a journal. Uh, if you're stuck kind of at home, what else are you going to do anyway, right? There's only so many video games you can play. Right? So an old, you know, pen and paper journal, uh, might be a good way to go. You can type it later. It's probably good emotionally just to write down what you're going through. And then later on, that's a primary source. Well, it's a primary source when you write it. So as historians, chapter 35, for example, we're doing secondary source stuff. We're reading what historians already interpreted. When you write a journal, when you take some photos during this clamp down, you're creating a primary source. Okay? You're eyewitnesses to history. And, um, boy, the last time we had a major pandemic, like something, even something like this, although it certainly wasn't exactly the same, it was 1918. And that's where I do a lot of my research, in the 1920s. And I, I, I've been, it's been really difficult to find personal recollections uh, of that pandemic. I think when people were going through it, they didn't, write it in their diaries, they maybe wanted to forget about it, certainly afterwards they didn't want to remember that or the war. So I have a lot of hospital records, newspaper accounts, but I've not really found a personal journals and diaries from the pandemic of 1918. Um, so look, we survived that as a society, it changed society, right? uh, but we got through it. And uh, maybe even some good things came out of it, certainly for the survival. Some good things coming out of this, too soon to tell, right? You do get to sleep in. Um, you can watch the videos many, many times. Um, the air is cleaner, and you get to spend more time with your families, or your roommates, I mean, whatever the case may be. All right, so enough on the current stuff. Let's jump back into another difficult period in human history, um, post-World War I. Uh, and I'm actually gonna take some of this into post-World War II. So we see the rise of nationalism, and political identities, whatever that means. Um, look, Ziegler and Salter, authors to this textbook, I don't know what you mean by that, political identities, so, so we'll have to define that some way. I think what they mean is, we do see the rise of nationalism, this quest for nations within Africa, African, and Asian colonies. Latin America, these were already independent nations, so well, did we see nationalism or something else? Maybe we saw, uh, especially young people, educated people, turning to socialism and communism as a means, they believe, to drive out the Colossus of the North, right? The United States was controlling the bulk of their economies. So, after World War I, we see nationalism, again, that hard-to-define phenomenon where you envision a nation and you want to create it, where you envision a nationality. We are all of the same language, we have the same customs and cultures and religion, we should have a nation. Um, that may work, 
right? We saw it coming out of the French Revolution, vive la France, the French saw themselves as united, especially when they were invaded by the Prussians and Austrians, but it didn't work so well for the Ottomans, right? Where you have many different ethnic groups, each one in their own nations. So nationalism can unite or divide. That's the, the tricky thing. Uh, in fact, we see that in, in India, rival nationalisms based largely on not so much language, scores of languages in South Asia, but nationalisms really arising out of religious identities, Hindu and Muslim, tied to place in, in many cases, um, tied to region. Okay? In China, we'll see an international competition for power, right? these outside forces trying to control China's destiny. Japan turned to militarism. Japan, uh, after 1867, modernizes industry, militarizes foreign policy. Africa, we shall see uh, colonials participating in World War I. So if you were in Senegal, French colony, you might be drafted to go fight in France against the Germans. Okay? Um, you might not even get to carry a gun, you might just get to carry a box of ammunition to the front lines. Okay? So colonials will participate in World War I. And after the war, the survivors, especially among the elite, the educated, will seek independence. We grew up believing that France or, or Britain or you know, these European nations were these, was heaven on earth, but we got there and it was hell. Why would we want to be part of that mother country, right, the metropole? We want our independence. In Latin America, we'll see this struggle against what we call neo-colonialism. So it wasn't so much the United States planting its flag, although it actually did in some places, um, it was planting the dollar. I mean, what, what William Howard Taft called dollar diplomacy. American investments. Americans going into places like Nicaragua and saying, you can only grow bananas and pineapples and coffee and anything else you need to buy from us. Yes, I'm exaggerating, okay? Uh, but the, the control of entire, mostly agricultural economies by the United States led to the rise of a, a kind of nationalism um, largely through political identity, meaning, uh, as, your, as the title of the chapter says, by perhaps turning to communism as a tool, they believe, erroneously, to drive out the, the big brother to the north. Uh, some nationalists will turn to communism, well, I just said that, right? Including the, the some of the Chinese. Right? Let's look first at India. Right? Uh, we have the Indian National Congress formed in 1885. We should govern ourselves, okay? Members of the Indian National Congress, but that wasn't uh, part of the government, that was a meeting, okay? A, a group of nationalists. Uh, initially, Hindus and Muslims both supported this drive for autonomy, or at least partial independence. Um, originally, they thought they could collaborate with the British. Okay, these are upper class, or even caste, uh, Hindus and Muslims working with the British. But after World War I, they're mostly going to move into opposition. Independence, now. Okay? Uh, India really suffered through World War I, not through invasion, but by food being pulled out of India, and troops uh, being pulled out of India, and uh, ancillary personnel, meaning, again, the guys who are going to carry stuff in the war, right, pulled out of India. Why? Because you had to. It's a colony of Britain. And if Britain wants you, you're going. Okay. There was actually starvation in India during World War I. So much food was exported. Uh, British will encourage development of the Muslim League. So if you're Britain and you don't want the smart and wealthy people of India uh, allying against you for independence, you divide them. Right? You're Hindu and the Muslims say these bad things about you. You're Muslim and the Hindu say these things, bad things about you. Right? Try to divide your antagonist. Okay? Um, successfully they will. India's quest for home rule. India um, rarely unified before the British, frankly. Okay? Rarely unified before the Mughals and, and British, but was linked by British rails, okay? it was linked by British law, even the English language, uh, was linked by the hardships the people of India suffered during World War I. Gandhi, British educated, Hindu, although uh, influenced by Jainism, um, lawyer in South Africa defending uh, people of color against the white minority rule there, okay? goes to India in the 1920s. Uh, excuse me, 1915, yes. So in the 1920s, he's organizing mass movements against British rule, boycotts of British goods. Okay. So if the British uh, 
make us buy their cotton, that's ridiculous, we'll, we'll have our own homespun. Okay, this is something in the Patriots and uh, the young United States were talking about during the Revolutionary War, right? We'll make our own stuff. 1937, Britain will grant India home rule, but the antagonisms between Muslims, some of whom wanted their own country, and Hindus, who frankly many of them wanted their own without Muslims, uh, was exacerbated, made worse by the Great Depression. So, fast forward from that, we will see uh, Gandhi using uh, moral force, peaceful uh, protest, non-violent protest against British rule, and making sure, frankly, that the media would cover uh, Salt March to the Sea, for example. When the British have a tax, T-A-X, on salt, Gandhi leads thousands of people to the Indian Ocean and takes salt out of the water, unless the water evaporates, right? The, there's no television at this time. There's certainly no computer, uh, internet. But there, there are movie rooms, okay? And the way people typically got their news was through the, the newspaper, but also by going to the, the cinema, the Nickelodeon, uh, the theater, and watching the newsreels. Now, they might be months old by the time you see them, but, but, but hey, that's the best you had, right? So you'd see these newsreels of Gandhi leading this mass protest against the British. And it started to turn the hearts and minds of, frankly, people in Britain against British rule okay, in India. Or misrule, some would say. In China, the uh, revolution in 1911 ended thousands of years of dynastic rule, rule by different families. In this case, the Manchu dynasty or the Qing were overthrown. But China would not be unified. China was divided between um, a democratic government, frankly, under Sun Yat-sen, uh, led by the nationalist called the Kuomintang. Okay? Uh, sometimes in older books called it, it's called the K, Kuomintang, uh, led by Sun Yat-sen, um, allied with the communists to try to create a government. But they were at war with so-called warlords. Uh, not the best term anymore, because some of the warlords who control the interior of China are actually quite cultured, educated men. But they tried to carve out regional uh, fiefdoms, regional states. So you have the official government under the Kuomintang, the Lai Wing Communists against the, these nationalists. There's civil war. Okay? Civil war. During the, in, during the civil war, the Kuomintang leader would turn and attack uh, the communists, um, Chinese Communist Party under Mao Zedong. Mao would break out of a siege and lead thousands of his followers on a long march through the interior of China, 6,000 some miles, um, during which time they convinced Chinese peasantry to support the Communist Party. So who's going to govern China? The Kuomintang, which had kind of the official prestige and the foreign support, or the Communists? Well, it's going to, out of the Civil War, uh, in the Japanese invasion beginning in 1937, we'll have an answer by 1949, okay? it'll be the communist. The Kuomintang will be, in a sense, exiled or even banished to Taiwan. Japan, as we saw in the previous lecture, became an imperialist nation. In a sense, copied the Western Europeans and the United States in becoming an industrialized imperial force. Okay? It will be hit hard by the Great Depression. Um, Japan, I love Japan, I've been there several times, I love the people of Japan, but in some ways, to over-exaggerate, as we always do in this course, um, it, it's volcanic rock, right? There's small pockets of arable soil, but the Japanese had to figure out how to produce a lot of stuff on a small amount of land, a small amount of tillable, farmable land. It became very efficient at doing that. And they learned how to buy raw materials from abroad, let's say iron ore or oil, rubber, and make that into something value-added, machinery or um, tires or whatever, what have you, right? Uh, and then sell it to the rest of the world. And with the profit, they could buy raw, more raw material. But during the Great Depression, the rest of the world isn't buying Japanese goods, Japanese manufactured goods. So it's hit hard by the Great Depression. And the citizens, of course, blame the government. Uh, in the government, there would be violence between the right and left. In fact, some liberals were uh, assassinated. Uh, Japan doesn't have enough money okay, to, to run the country. 
And what do you do? You can borrow money and continue to buy the stuff you need, like oil, metal, ores, or you can, in a sense, in a sense steal. And the imperialists in Japan opted for number two. Right? China's weak, let's take, take the stuff from northern China. Korea's weak, we can take stuff out of Korea. They would already been doing that. Right? Um, so we see the militarists gain power in Japan um, during the Great Depression, claiming that we can, we can take that stuff out there from these weak, so-called inferior countries. Why would we borrow money and buy this stuff? And they came into power. In 1931, the Japanese took Manchuria. This is a northern Chinese province. They turned it into their own colony called Manchukuo. They actually put, uh, they put the, uh, this is somewhat complicated, but they put the, the last emperor, who was a child during the 1911-1912 revolution, in power uh, as this kind of puppet ruler in Manchukuo. The Chinese leader, uh, Shang Shishai, sometimes pronounced Shang Kai-shek, appealed to the League of Nations for help. League of Nations, China's a member, we're being invaded, we're part of our country being ripped away. Uh, the founding principle is that an attack on one is an equated to an attack on all, help us. And the League was largely silent, chastised Japan, and Japan quit the League. So, we see nationalism arising, as we mentioned at the outset. We'll conclude here, uh, we'll do part two in a moment. I'll do it in a moment. You can watch it whenever. Um, we see nationalism arising in India, uh, little rival nationalisms where Hindus contested control with Muslims, especially in different regions, Northwest India, Northeast India, predominantly populated by Muslims. China, there was internal competition for power uh, between the government and these so called warlords, regional leaders, uh, that turned into a civil war between communist and the Guomindang, the official government, and Japan will turn to militarism. So we'll pause there and come back in part two when we look at Africa and Latin America.